back some 49 years ago, sitting in a little Baptist church in Amarillo, Texas, and on a Saturday night prayer meeting, and most of the men were at the altar praying, and I was three or four rows, four rows back, had only been a Christian two months. And I remember the Lord coming and gra- grabbing a hold of my heart, such a profound anointing that something I could never forget nor even attempt to or want to. And I ran to the front of the altar, fell on the altar, and cried out, I surrender. The Lord was calling me to preach. And I should have known then I wouldn't wind up as a Baptist because the way I demonstrated myself on the altar was a little bit intense. (laughs) But there was a setting of my will that day. There was something in me that said yes. And I did it with such a definitive statement that I literally locked myself in for the rest of my life, pursuing the call of God. And as I get into this word this morning, I was reminded of that because it's when you set your wheel, it's like you're pulling a trigger on a gun. Don't want to use crude illustration, but you're, you're releasing something that cannot be stopped. The will that we have is so powerful, even of itself, but let alone the power that is released when the will of man marries the will of God. It releases something that creates a force upon the earth that literally has the power and the potential to change the earth. And God called the church in this hour to be changers, to be disruptors. We find there's a spirit of disruption right now in our nation. And a lot of people are upset by that, but I rejoice in it because it takes that happening in the midst of us, something disrupting us in order to get us to change. Change never comes from a place of passivity or a place of contentment. Change can only come from a place where there's discomfort or there's need. So I often look upon my needs with joy because the greater the need, the greater the opportunity. The greater the mountain, the greater the potential of achieving victory. We look in Psalm 78 today and we see an interesting story that most of you are familiar with, I'm sure. But it's the story about a people that we're faced with one of two choices, either believe God or don't believe God. And we understand that there's consequences to what we choose. How many know there's consequences to your faith? There's consequences to when you say, I believe. There's also consequences when you don't believe or when you falter or pull back. So in Psalm 78, we see this beautiful story that David's telling about the children of Israel going through a time of great distress, yet at the same time, there was a great promise. And I often found that to be the case. When distress comes, and the scripture calls that tribulation or trials. But when trials come, God stands ready to reveal his glory in the midst of us. If you're like I am, I want to be on the right side of the equation. I don't want to be on the the losing side. I want to be on the winning side. Everybody say, I'm a winner. winner. None of us want to choose the side that, that perishes or the side that ends up in futility. But we want to come down on the side where the perpetual blessings of the Lord begin to flow into our life. And 
the song this morning was so appropriate because if we start out in the book of Psalms chapter 78, we, we hear this thing about generations. It says in verse one, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known. And our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Every generation should be in position to become a generation that becomes more than the generation before it. Amen? When God established his nation upon the earth, he formed that through the heart of one man called Abraham. God chose Abraham because Abraham believed God. God will choose you according to your willingness to believe him. How many believe that God's appointed you for greatness? He's appointed all of you for greatness. He's appointed all of you for goodness. He's appointed all of you, appointed all of you to excel. But the, to the point of your achievement of that greatness, now greatness in him, of course, not in yourself, to the point of the goodness being revealed in you is entirely dependent upon your response to what he has spoken. Jesus said, everything that I am is because of what he has spoken to me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the foundation for every generation is establishing itself upon the revealed truth of the Lord. You see, truth that God reveals never changes. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And we make a sore mistake when we try to change God's word to accommodate the current generation or the current trends. Doesn't mean that our methods may not change or be altered. It may mean that we present things differently in vocabulary, but we should never alter the truth because it's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth that establishes us and positions us to become the inheritors of all that God has to give us. Amen. So we don't water down the gospel, right? We don't change the message or the gospel in order to accommodate the hearers of the word. Because it's only through the truth that the hearers can actually become something greater than what they could be any other way. When you side up with God, Guess what? There's no limitation on what can happen with you. Amen? Everybody say, no limitations, no restraints. God does not hold back anything to those that have a heart to receive it. That's good news, isn't it? So the previous generation becomes a building block. And I look at my own life in the life of some of you here that maybe you're a little bit what we call some the term that most of you've never heard, long in the tooth. I guess that derived when people get older, their gums shrink and uh, their teeth get longer. <laughs> That's the only explanation. Amen. A lot of things get bigger as you grow older, right? Noses and ears and stomachs and, you know, teeth get longer, but th there's a purpose in each generation and that's to become a foundation for the next. 
You know, Hebrews, and I'll just deep tear over there for a second. I love this part in Hebrews chapter 2, verse um, 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Amen. So we know that this thing that God is bringing forth on the earth has one conclusion, completion. The temple be completed. That there be once again a people upon the earth that can become the temple of God. There's only one reason to have the temple, so that someone else can inhabit it. We build it, we're part of it, we're the stones of it, but we're only being positioned so that we can welcome his glory into the midst of it. See, the church is not the church just to be the church. The church is the church to become the habitation of the Lord. That Christ may dwell in the midst of us. You know, he prayed that in the book of Ephesians. He said, he said that may Christ dwell in us, that he may reveal through us his fullness. That through us may be the revelation of who God is. That if they've seen us, they've actually seen the Lord because he dwells in the midst of us. Great is he, brethren, in the midst of you. Hallelujah. So we grow up into this temple, this place of abiding. You know, in chapter three, verse 10, it says, verse Ephesians, to the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. Remember when the Lord brought us to Austin, Texas back in 1984, the word that he spoke to my heart Go to Austin and take authority over the principalities and the powers of the city. And so ever since then, we've not been overly impressed with big crowds, even though we've had big crowds. We've not been overly disappointed with small crowds, even though we've had many small crowds. Because we understand that our mission is even greater than that. Our mission is to become and become a witness to the powers and the principalities of the air, to declare unto them the kingdom of God upon the earth, to stand in resistance to the spirit of this age that would try to destroy the generational blessing that God wants to bring to the body of Christ in this hour. Amen? Wow, there's some juice on that. Now the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. So I want you to understand this morning and bring it into context that you being here today, you being a part of this is something greater than what you can see. It's something greater than what you may be able to comprehend and you can't sure not judge it nor measure it but what you see. You have to understand that as we stand in this place of faith, as we stand in this place as a block that's been honed out of a mountain without hands, as we stand in this place of foundation, that we are a, a testimony of the wisdom of God against the principalities and the powers of the air. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood as the manner is of some. We're not here to struggle and try to create something out of our own initiative, our own fleshly endeavor. We're here to declare the word of the Lord to the heavens. Because ultimately that changes the destiny of a region. Amen. Wow. How long will you go on preaching? How long will you keep declaring it, the Bible says? How long until, Lord, you establish your kingdom upon the earth? I will not keep silent. I will not take my rest in Zion, nor find a hammock underneath a tree to relax. But I will stand and declare the praises of my God. 
Amen. Yeah. Woo. I love this. Oh, it's in Beth going better. According to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Isn't it great that God just saw fit to bring everything that is, everything that was, everything that is now, everything that will be. He brought it to pass through one man, Jesus. Hallelujah. That Jesus is here this morning. Wow. Wow. Revealing his power in whom now, because of this Christ, everybody say, because of this Christ, because of this Christ, Christ, we have boldness and confidence. Woo. We have boldness and confidence through faith in him. I tell you, there's nothing like hooking yourself on to him the Lord to create in you something different than what you thought you were. Well, I'm just timid and weak and oh, I'm just so sinful and I'm so pitiful. No, you're not. When you grab hold of the Lord, now you can have boldness and confidence because now you have access by faith to him. This one that gives you faith, faith pours it into your spirit like driving a nail into a piece of wood, he drives that into your spirit. Cannot be moved again. When faith enters your heart, it creates in you the strength that you never knew was possible within yourself. Because when you look at yourself, you become critical of it. You become critical of your old nature, critical of your lack and critical of your need, all this stuff. But when you look to Christ, you see the sufficiency that's in him. Paul said it best. He said, when I'm weak, then I find his strength in me. Hallelujah. When I'm beat down, I found that he lifts me up. When I'm naked, I find that he clothes me. When I'm hungry, I find that he fills me. When I am thirsty, I drink of the Lord. Wow. (laughs) Therefore, I ask you this, brethren. Do not lose heart. (laughs) How many have come close to losing heart? Not talking about me. Come close to losing your own heart, losing your own faith, losing your own determination, losing the joy that God has for you. Don't lose it, my brethren. Hold on to it. He said, he said my tribulations that I've had for you, this is your glory. See, and no matter what we face, Christ faced it first. No matter what temptation you go through or what pain you suffer or loss that you feel, Christ has felt it for you and has given you a victory in the midst of it. Take it not lightly, brethren, when you fall into these various trials. Rejoice in them yourself because Christ has triumphed mightily in the midst of us. In Psalm 78, He talks to these people. Here these children of Israel were in the wilderness. They came out of Egypt. They went into the wilderness. What should have taken them 11 days? Took them 40 years. And often I think of that. Lord, why am I taking so long? To finally say, yes, Lord, I believe. Why am I, Lord, wandering out here in some desolate place when I know, Lord, you have prepared a land flowing for me, flowing with milk and honey. Why, Lord, am I desolate when I know that there's abundance just over the hill? Mm. Wow. So he says, this is what we need to do, you fathers, you foundational people, this is what you need to say. You need to remind everyone this marvelous things he has done 
in the sight of their fathers. In the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan, he divided the sea and he caused them to pass through. Mm. So just about the time you say, how much more of this wilderness could I stand? The word needs to come. He divided the sea. Don't you remember? Don't you remember we passed through that, that because of him, because there was a Passover lamb that was slain, we were able to escape the bondages of Egypt. We were able to come out of the place of slavery and go to the land that God had promised us. He made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with the cloud. In the night, he led them with a light of fire. He split the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and he caused waters to run down like rivers. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Think about it. The great thing that God has done, we need to declare it in this generation. And not only for this generation, for the generation to come. We need to start reminding all of this next generation, whatever you call them, the millennials or the, what are they all? X, Y, Z's, whatever they are. We need to remind them how great our God is. How great our God is. How he has overcome every situation. How he triumphed over the devil. He destroyed the works of the enemy. We need to declare that our God is a mighty God. Amen. That salvation is only through him and him alone. Nothing of ourselves merits it, but none of our righteousness is from ourselves, but our righteousness is from our God. We declare that to this generation and declare it to the generation to come. We don't want to give them some platitudes about how they're, they, they, they need to do this and do that. We, we need to declare what he can do for them. Right. He is mighty. He is able to deliver them and to save them. Amen. Amen. Declare the truth to the generations. Hallelujah. He goes on to say it's going to get better. Verse 23, yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna on them to eat. And he gave them the bread of angels. Wow. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. He gave them the bread of angels. Well, we think manna is just some unseasoned bread calls it the bread of angels. Some better than eating Hawaiian bread <laughs> or pumpkin bread. I don't know, I had some pretty good cinnamon roll bread yesterday. That back come close. Put it in the toaster with a little butter on top. Mmm. <clears throat> it tastes so good. Your mouth wants to water. Well, taste, see, my brethren, the Lord is good. His mercies endure forever. He comes and he gives to us this bread of angels. If you've ever tasted of this, you know what I'm talking about. Once you've tasted of the Lord, how can you ever turn back to something less than that? Because this is so great, how can we compare that which was? Let's taste again the Lord, the bread of angels. Let's drink the milk that flows from the hills. Hallelujah. Wow. Men ate angels' food, and he sent food to be, them to be full. Not only that, but he caused the wind to blow from the east. And then he brought a south wind, and he rained meat on them like the dust. So, well, I thought all they were eating was a bunch of stagnant bread. No, it said feathered fowl fell on them like the sands of the seas. <laughs> Woo! Woo! I wonder if they even had to clean them. Woo! He, they fell in the midst of their camp and all around their habitations, there's fowl were falling down. Let's sing a song about that. <laughs> about the falling fowl. 
They didn't even have shotguns. The Lord was shooting them from above. Falling foul all around us. Cluck, 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 cluck. Quack, 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 quack. <laughs> Falling foul. They said they ate. And they were filled. Ugh. And he didn't even know at that time when he was writing this about Texas barbecue. <laughs> or the Brazilian steakhouse where you should go there if you want to eat all the meat you can eat. You can, you can, you can, when you do that, when you get down to a place and they bring all the meat you can eat, just remember how the children of Israel felt. They didn't look like Holocaust survivors. Skeletons coming out of the, they were filled. The fat of the Lord was their portion. They drank of the sweet nectar of the Lord. Wow, this is what God is saying to those in the wilderness. Remember this, remember how God has provided for you. Remember how when you even, didn't even think about it, or didn't even believe for it, it showed up for you. God was always there extending his mercy to you. His grace became sufficient to every need that you had. Everywhere you go, there he is on your left, on your right, and behind and in front. There, God, can, how you, can you escape him? He's everywhere. Hallelujah. Taste and see the Lord is good. Mm. Wow. He gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving. But even while they were still chewing, God got upset with them because they just not believed him the way they should. Have you ever been that way? God has carried you maybe for a year or two or five years, 10 years, 20 years, some of you 30 years, some of you 40, some like getting long in the tooth guys like me, 50 years plus. And then all of a sudden you wake up one morning, oh my God, oh my God, I'm, I'm so pitiful, it hurts. Oh, what challenges I have. How am I gonna pay the bills? How am I gonna survive another day? And here I am just like these jerks. Just like these guys, have I not remembered how God provided a way? Have I not remembered how he split the sea? How I not remember that night that I ate that Passover lamb and that death angel passed me by and the next morning they came and knocked on my door with tears in their eyes and said, get ready, let's leave now, let's go. Have I not remember the great salvation of our God? Oh, but you don't understand, things have gotten tough. Yeah, for you and me both, it's tough. Life is tough, it's hard. But all we gotta do is remember the generation. It's like in America right now, we need to remember the greatest generation. We need to remember in America what it was like to sacrifice, what it was like for our, our fathers and grandmothers that lived through the depression, that went through the World War II, that forged out of this wilderness place called America, a great nation, a nation that stands for truth and liberty and justice and freedom for all. We need to remember that instead of going astray and walking into the pathways that are trying to lead us into the destruction in this hour. We need to remember the fathers that birthed us. The worst mistake every generation can make is thinking that they are the generation that's gonna reinvent the wheel. No, you're only, a, you're only a spoke in the wheel that's already been made. You're only a part of the peace that God has already created. Don't cry to become something different. Just lock yourself into that which is. Jesus Christ will prevail on every situation. Hallelujah. The only way our country will prevail as if it stands firm on his foundation. If we try to destroy our foundation, we've lost everything, just like this word. If we don't stand on this word, this word is truth. This word, I am the way, I am the truth. 
I am the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. If we ever deviate from that, if we ever deviate that there was a Christ that was born in a manger, that died on a cross, that rose from the dead, that ascended to heaven to the right hand of the Father, if we ever deviate from that, we've lost everything because this is the foundation of who we are. This is the stone, the rock that God has created in us to become that which he wants to declare to the earth. We are a people that shall not be moved. We are people planted by the water. And because of our commitment and our planting, we are birthing the fruit of the Lord in the midst of us. Hallelujah. Woo. Remember those things that Christ has done for us. We'll be a people in this hour that will either be a people that will have an unlimited God or we'll be a people that limit what God can do through us. It says in verse 41, it says, yes, again, they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. Mm. Lord, help us not be a people that ever limits what you can do. But help us be a people that receive an unlimited God into our lives. When we limit God, you see, the, the, the truth is this. God, in his sovereignty, is chosen not to be sovereign. That makes sense? God is strength and all that he is is chosen not to pursue that route. The route he's chosen to pursue is through you. His greatness can never be revealed to the earth until it's revealed through us. His power can never be demonstrated apart from us. His wisdom can never be revealed apart from us. But like it or not, our marriage covenant with him has necessitated that he fulfill his covenant through us upon the earth. If not, then why would he even need us? Just let him do it all. Start, turn it over to the Lord. Lord, it's, this is your problem, not mine. Forget about it. No, the Lord said, it's, I want you. I've chosen you to be a royal priesthood. I've chosen you to be a holy nation. Hallelujah. I've chosen you to be my praises to the earth. You're the one that I've chosen. Point to your own chest and say, he chose me. Wow. Makes you pretty special, doesn't it? He chose you. Isn't that cool? Everybody say, it's cool. It's more than cool. <laughs> Amen. But he said that they limited God. So when you limit the Lord, you limit what God can do for you, but you also limit what God can do through you. Now, the, the, it says the crux to this whole thing was that the reason they turned back, it says in verse 37, their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in the, in the covenant. It's amazing how little the Lord requires of us. All he requires of us is for us to keep presenting our heart before him knowing even that we cannot perfect this heart, we cannot cleanse this heart, but it only comes to serve him. That in presenting ourselves to the Lord, he comes and perfects us. He comes and cleanses us. He comes and transforms us. Amen? Yeah. Beholding the Lord as in a mirror, we're transformed from glory to glory and from image to image. It's in that presentation of our life before the Lord. It's like laying our heart bare and saying, Lord, this is our heart. This is who we are. We want you to create in us a new heart, oh God. We want you to create in us a heart that has your spirit, your heart, your motivation, your love in it. Lord, let us be the revelation of who you are through this heart that you've put before us. And that's all it requires, that you come and bring your heart and that you enter into the covenant and stay faithful in it. Mm. And what does that mean? Sometimes you just got to show up when you don't feel like it. 
When you're in a covenant, sometimes it's just required of you just to be there. Amen? It's like in your marriage. Well, I got a little upset with my wife, so I'm just going to split for a few days. How many of you have ever tried that? It doesn't work, does it? I hadn't tried it. I'm scared to death. <laughs> well, she upset me, so I'm just not going to talk to her for 24 hours. Bless God. I'll show her. Well, I've, I've broken covenant. You see what I'm saying? Covenant literally means that you're all the time 100% engaged with the other person. It's in your engagement with that person or your interaction with that person that creates between the two of you, one. Because covenant is meant to bring two parties together to become one demonstration, one revelation. If you've seen me, you've seen her. If you've seen her, you've seen me. If you've seen me, you've seen him. If you've seen him, you've seen me. Christ is in you and I'm in Christ. We're together, we're all one together. Amen. Amen. So it says, those that, that were not steadfast in their heart and they were not faithful in their covenant, these were the ones that hindered and slowed down the progression of the children of Israel entering the promised land. And the more you grow distant, the slower your progress becomes for the destiny you're supposed to fulfill. Until it literally bogs down to the place it no longer moves. You stop right there. See, the Lord never intended for you to stop. He intended for, to bring you out so that he could quickly bring you in. He wanted to bring you out so that he could pretty quickly begin to fulfill everything that he's called you to be in your life. He wants to manifest that through you. And the only thing that can stop him is a heart that's not steadfast and an unfaithfulness in your ability to have covenant. And they kept provoking him over and over again. Verse 56, they tested, they provoked the most high God. They did not keep his testimonies. They turned back and actively acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. In other words, they became a selfish people. people carved images means that you've created other gods besides him in your life. It's called selfishness. Selfishness is when you build your own, you build a, you build a, a wall around the things that you most cherish, even if they have nothing to do with God. And you become selfish. So you begin to live to protect that place that you've built instead of exposing it to the light of God. Selfishness. Let me ask you a question. Do you know any selfish people? Who are you thinking about? <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> but the question is, is there any selfishness in us? Yeah. See, when Jesus was taken to the manger, we're taken to the inn. They wanted him to go to the inn, right, with Mary? But there was no room in the inn. Where was the room at? In the manger. Now, why do you suppose that there was no room in the inn? Well, obviously there was people in the inn. Don't you think that someone would have had compassion upon a woman that's pregnant and fixing to have birth? No, they put her in a manger instead. So Christ was birthed in a manger. And that's where a lot of people keep their Christ is in a manger. We want to be in proximity to God. We want to be, know that he's close by, but we really don't want him in the house. 
What would happen if Jesus really came into the church of Christ in America right now? If he really came in, I mean really came in, I mean manifested himself in the midst of us, showed up. Wow. Do we really want him or would rather keep him at a distance? Well, the human nature doesn't really want him. Face it, we don't really want him. We want him close by, religiously connected to him. Oh, did you know that Jesus is out in the manger? Wow. Woo. Don't it make you feel spiritual? He's in the manger. They said, no, I want to be in, in your house. Psalms 12, it says this. I love this here. This is cool. Most of this stuff is cool. Amen. <laughs> I, all of it, I guess I gotta say it's all of it, right? Who has said with our tongue we pro will prevail in verse four of chapter 12 and our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Hmm. Who's Lord over us? Amen. Think about it. Who is Lord over you? Who's Lord of your mind? Are your, is your mind set upon heavenly places? Who's Lord of your emotions? Are your emotions tempered and, and processed by the Spirit of God or is it something that comes out of your own volatility? Is he Lord over your will? Or is your will the self-determining path that you choose? Or do you choose the path of his will? That's the question, isn't it? This is getting heavy in here, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody say heavy. heavy. <laughs> Woo. And I'm getting drunk while you're getting heavy. <laughs> so who's Lord over your will, over your emotions, over your mind, and over your heart? Who is the Lord of your life? See, so that becomes a real defining moment in this hour in the church, doesn't it? Everyone wants Christ to be a savior, a healer, a deliverer. Wow. But how many really want him to be a Lord? Sometimes that separates, separates the crowd. Let's put Jesus in the house. When Jesus is in the house. Mm. Man, I, I tell you what, I want to say, declare in my heart that right now, Lord, be in this house like never before. Lord, be in this house like never before. Wow. Wouldn't it be great if we could say that with such sincerity of truth that we would not let him come through any filters, but would, we would welcome him in an unfiltered version of him in the midst of us. Who will stand when he appears, it says in the book of Malachi. He will come like a fuller's fire and soap, and he will purify the sons of Levi. Who can resist in that day when he comes in the midst of us? Who can stand and blaspheme against his name when he's right in front of you? Glory. <sighs> Do you want it? Do you need it? Yes. Do you crave it? Yes. yes, Lord. No matter what it costs us, please, Lord, come back to the end. Yeah. We're sorry. We repent. We've kept you in a manger too long. We've worshiped you from afar for so long, Lord. We've forgotten what it was like to have that intimate face-to-face -face encounter with you. Oh, a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord. Whew. I hope you're getting this in live stream. I hope you can feel what I feel. I didn't sign up for the feelings, but I love them when they come. <laughs> it's kind of like you go to the restaurant, you eat, 
And the guy comes and says, would you like some dessert? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to be guilty about it. Please don't show me a dessert menu with a calorie counter. That's an abomination to God. They show you this dessert. And, oh, your mouth is watering. Oh, then they show 1,250 calories for two bites. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here. That's the Lord. See, when the Lord comes, he's like this dessert that comes and he just brings all the calories with him. Mm. Woo. Wow. It's more than you can stand when the Lord comes. I like it when the Lord comes. How many kind of like it when the Lord comes? Woo. That's what we live for here, isn't it? You're, you're, you came to Austin Cathedral this morning because of the incredible programs we have. Right? You came because of the refined, dignified preacher that you possess, right? You came because of, it's all done in order and decently and no one gets offended because it's nothing too extreme for anyone to be challenged, right? That's why you came. <laughs> if you came for that, you wouldn't be here right now. Woo! Lord, it's amazing how people, most, many people don't even make two songs. They don't know what they're missing. They didn't get to me. <laughs> well, my God, if the, if the song offends them, what are they going to do when I stand up here? <laughs> <laughs> what about it, Rob? <laughs> you love this stuff? Are you giggling? Giggle some more. <laughs> oh, are you happy? Get happy some more. Yeah. Woo. Lord, we're pressing in. Oh. You see, these are a people that didn't possess anything. Kind of like us. They didn't possess anything. They were so poor that there was no term for poor at the time. There, you couldn't even define poor because poor was it's usually something just above the bottom, but they were below the bottom. What would you call those kind of people? Lost, right? They possessed nothing. Even though the moment God showed up, everything then became theirs. Yeah. Wow. All the pastures, all the land was theirs. All this place that gave milk and honey, became, they became the inheritors of it. All the hills were theirs. All the hills that gave all the metals and all the things that they needed to form their society and build their cities. Amen. Wow. Then the cities they even inhabited that they did not build, that contained not only houses, but they moved in ready-made furnished. Uh, furnished. Uh, right? <laughs> you didn't get it? They were already furnished, already ready to inhabit. God said, I've prepared all this for you. Everything has been provided in advance because you heard what I had to say. Amen. Everything was theirs the moment they stepped out of Egypt. Just like you, the moment you stepped out of your sin the moment you stepped out of your disobedience, the moment you stepped out of, of your lostness, everything became yours in Christ Jesus. All things that pertain to life and godliness are now yours in Christ. Just all you gotta do is just keep bringing that heart, standing fast in that covenant, and everything that you dreamed Everything you believed, everything you hoped for, everything you longed for 
becomes yours. Everything in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow. Wow. So let it be written. So let it be done. Amen. Good. Stand up. Yeah, stand up with me. Whew. I, I, I tell you what, I'm just enjoying this presence this morning. How about you? Lift your hands to the Lord. Say this with me. Lord, I lift my hands to the King of glory, to the one who supplies all my needs, who provides all my, all my direction, meets all my need, creates in me a heart that stands from generation to generation. Lord, I will not pull back in the day of battle. I will not tempt my God. My armor is fully on. I've been anointed by the Lord. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. He's made me sufficient and able to do everything he's called me to be. I will not draw back, but I press forward with confidence, with boldness in my God. My God, my God is a mighty army and he has conquered all things. He's taken over everything and he's provided all for me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God.